Today's video, I'll take you through the entire journey of vector databases. But before I cover that, I want to kickstart today's discussion with natural language processing. Well, NLP or natural language processing is a branch of artificial intelligence that focuses on the interactions between computers and humans through natural language. The goal of NLP is to enable computers to understand, interpret and generate human language in a very valuable way. It involves several components including syntax, semantics and pragmatics. The initial models were based out of simpler approaches like bag of words, then came word embeddings, then we have RNNs, LSTM based models, bidirectional LSTMs, then attention based networks and finally the king that is ruling all the large language models today which is transformers. So the field of NLP has basically seen remarkable progress in recent years. Milestone models such as BERT and GPT-3 are all based on the transformer architecture. With the advances out of the way, let's go forward and I'll introduce you to the concepts of vectors now. Let me start off the discussion by sharing some light on what a vector is. Simply put, a vector is nothing else but an array of numbers. It can be basically used to represent coordinates on a plane. So say for example, I have a vector denoted by the numbers 3 comma 4. In the list that you see right now, you have two numbers, which is where I require two axes to represent this particular vector. How do I represent this? Well, a simple way of going about with this particular activity, translate the x axis by three units, translate the y axis by four units, you will reach a point which is in our case 3 comma 4. So the vector representation is basically an arrow starting from the origin to the point 3 comma 4. Now in this example, the list had only two elements. What if there are three elements? In this example, now you can represent the vector in three dimensions. So you have an x axis, y axis and a z axis. Is there a limit in terms of how many vector spaces you can utilize? Well, we can visualize three dimensional to a certain extent, but you can go till n dimensions. So this is the power of how you can represent vectors. So you can represent complex objects in form of vectors across different dimensions, which is what you see in the below example. Now, what are vector embeddings? This is something that you have to understand if you have to really appreciate the advances of natural language processing. So NLP models don't work with plain text. Whenever you have a sentence like my name is Bhavesh, it's basically converted into a numeric representation and then the models are able to process it. So the underlying idea is for every text that you want to process, you have to convert that into a numeric representation. So word embeddings is a class of techniques where the word is represented as a real value vector. It's basically a representation of a word in a continuous vector space. So here every point is basically a vector that is represented for some form of a word and words which are very similar to each other would basically lie in this particular vector space. So this is how basically a text is converted into a number. Say for example, you have words like cat, kitten, dog, houses that you've kind of encoded in form of a vector. Now the individual dimensions may not add significant value, but when you project from a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, the words which are very close to each other and if the training of the word to vec model or any other model that converts text to numbers has been done accurately, then words which are very similar to each other will be very closer in the lower dimensional space. So this is an example of a word embedding. Now that we have a fair sense of idea of what vector embeddings are, I'll now touch upon the applications of vector embeddings. Say for example, if you have a database of words and you want to search by meaning, then vector embeddings come in very handy. So understanding search by meaning or applying semantic search is where the first use case of vector embeddings come in. Instead of just looking for the same words, we can make search engines much more faster. They can understand what you mean and find better results by special codes that capture the ideas of your search. The next piece of application is smart answering machines. We can teach a system to pair questions with the right answers. Using vector embeddings, it can thus give you answers to questions that it has never heard before. 
Now imagine you have images and if you want to search for images, how do you do it? We can use special codes to basically help and find images for us. Images can again be represented in form of vectors and then searching through vectors to find out what we are looking for is again made possible because of vector embeddings. We've spoken that text can be converted into embeddings. We've also realized that images can also be converted into embeddings. But what about sounds? Well, we can turn sounds into embeddings as well, which can help us find similar sounds or piece of music as well that we are looking for. A vector database is a type of database to store, index and manage vector data, which are arrays of numbers or embeddings representing a complex data point. This complex data point can be an image, can be text, can be audio. Anything that you can think of which can be represented as numbers, all of those can be represented as embeddings and can be stored in a vector database. Unlike traditional databases that store scalar values like integers, strings, etc. Vector databases are optimized for high dimensional vector data. This is where vector databases are kind of gaining so much of popularity. Now I'll take you through the process of how a vector database works. In the context of text data, words or sentences can be converted into numbers. Vector DBs use specialized techniques to efficiently store and retrieve high dimensional vector data. These indexes are designed in such a way that you can search quickly through multiple vectors and retrieve the result that you're looking for. Examples of indexing techniques include tree based structures like KD tree, ball tree, etc. Then there are hashing based methods as well. And then there are partition based methods as well. How does a vector database give you the result? Well, in that case, it uses something called a similarity search. There are multiple optimizations that have been carried out with respect to vector databases so that they can scale really well. Some vector databases also use GPUs in order to get the similarity search results quickly. So there are multiple techniques that vector databases use in order to give you the right performance and scalability. Here is where now I'll introduce you to an amazing vector database called as Quadrant. Quadrant is basically an open source vector database designed for storing and searching high dimensional vector data with a focus on machine learning applications. It provides efficient indexing and retrieval for similarity search. You can basically configure a lot of things in Quadrant based on how you want to perform similarity search, etc. Thus, it basically enables user to find the most relevant items based on vector proximity. Quadrant is optimized for performance and scalability. It supports multiple algorithms to give you the right result based on what latency that you expect the responses to be at. With a RESTful API and rich feature set including say filtering, full text search and payload support, Quadrant is a versatile solution for developers looking to leverage the power of vector search in their projects. So here you can clearly see the benchmarking analysis done for DBpedia OpenAI dataset. The current number of threads that are set are 100. Based on the different parameters of precision, these are the RPS numbers. So RPS is request per second, higher the value, the better they are. So here in this particular use case and data set, Quadrant is doing a fantastic job. In case of latency, now again latency should be as low as possible, which is the case that we are seeing here as well. So the latency in terms of getting the response for this particular data set is as low as possible. Similarly, you have a P95 latency numbers. Again, here as well, Quadrant has the lowest P95 latency numbers. And if I look at the index time, it's again very low. That simply signifies that you can kind of quickly create indexes for your data, which is where again Quadrant outshines the competition that exists. Now I'll show you a beginner friendly video on how Quadrant works in Python. So let's get started. I'm using Google Collab for this particular demo and I'll kind of show you a hello world demo in terms of how you can utilize the amazing powers of Quadrant in your day to day workflows. So let me start off the activity with the installation and the import section. So I'll quickly run this cell. So now that the installation and the imports are done. Now I'll take you through the data set as well. Now here I have a list of strings. 
एंड ईच स्ट्रिंग बेसिकली कंसिस्ट ऑफ अ स्टोरी रिगार्डिंग सचिन तेंडुलकर सो इज बेसिकली अ लिस्ट ऑफ मल्टीपल सेंटेंसेज विच विल बी सेव्ड इन टू अ वेक्टर डेटा बेस सो आई क्विकली रन दिस सेल टू फर्स्टली क्रिएट द डेटा सेट द नेक्स्ट थिंग दट आई विल डू इज आई क्रिएट अ वेरिएबल कॉल्ड एज इनपुट अंडर स्कोर कलेक्शन अंडर स्कोर नेम विच विल बी सचिन अंडर स्कोर कलेक्शन Think of this as a table name in your MySQL database. So, if I have to refer a particular collection in a vector database, think of that as a table that I want to refer. Now, here is where I create the database. The first command that I'll run is quadrant client. Now, here you have multiple options of creating a client. Firstly, you can use quadrants API services. Secondly, you can use quadrants Docker images. Thirdly, if you want like a very simple version that runs on your memory, then you can use an input called as memory. So, which is what I'm using right now. Given this is like a hello world example, so I create an instance of the class client, and I add the collection name that I have defined above. And basically, through these set of commands, I'm creating a vector database locally with the collection name equal to Sachin underscore collection. So these are the various entries that have been created inside the vector database. All of these are basically indexes. Now, if I call the get underscore collection command and if I pass in the input collection, this contains all the information about how the vector database is defined. What kind of similarity search do you want to perform? What are the embedding models that you want to use? All of the values. If you are okay with it, you can stick to the default values. If there are values that you want to change going forward, then essentially you can do that as well while you create an instance of this particular client. Now that we have everything set up, let's query our database and get some results. So imagine I have an input query text called as IPL. There was a mention of Sachin playing the IPL. I don't know exactly which document it falls into, so I'll create a variable called as input underscore query underscore text. I'll kind of equate that to IPL, which is what I have here. Now, what I'll do is I'll say client dot query. I'll specify the collection name that I want to search for the result, and I'll also pass in the input query text, which is the variable that we've created above. So I'll get a search result. In this search result, what you see are the responses of the various entries that are existing in the vector database. and the results are basically sorted by the similarity of what the query is so my question was regarding the ipl and here the maximum score is given to the document which contains ipl and the score value is 0.8871 this is the power of quadrant and this is what i wanted to show you as well so imagine i am doing this locally right now which looks normal But if you have tons and tons of documents, if you have huge PDFs with say ten thousand, twenty thousand pages, and if you want to quickly search your results, or if you want to build a rag-based system which is highly scalable, then Quadrant is the way to go forward. So I wanted to take you through the journey of NLP and talk about vector databases, and I also wanted to introduce Quadrant to all of you. I hope you found this video informative. Thank you so much for watching the video.